Welcome to Classical Chats. I'm Tiffany. Today we are talking with Laura Granero. She is a pianist, a forte pianist, and I am very much looking forward to talking with her about her journey, how she got interested in the harpsichord and forte piano, which for those who don't know is the early model, early version of the modern piano that we see today from centuries ago, how she got interested in historical instruments at a young age, how she's been navigating through her studies, juggling between piano and historical instruments. In addition to performing, she's also a guest lecturer and professor, and I might even learn a thing or two about historical performances from her. Welcome to Classical Chats, Laura. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's really great. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to have a forte pianist um, and do this on Classical Chats, not do this on Classical Chats, to meet you on Classical Chats and talk about your journey. I've been fascinated with historical instruments, and so I'm very curious about your journey, how you got started. It seems like Beethoven um, is an inspiration on your piano <laughs> journey there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, maybe you can start off with um, telling us how your journey with classical music started and then eventually the forte piano. Yeah, Beethoven uh, says hi. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> he was, you know, like the hero of all the romantic composers, so I feel that. I should just get a little uh, Beethoven to accompany me every morning and be grumpy if I didn't practice. Um, yeah, so, well, I started um, maybe a bit late for um, classical music um, standards. Well, it depends. Um, I, um, I was born in Madrid and I grew up uh, there. And actually in, in Spain, it's um, we have a very kind of um, officialized system of, of music studies, kind of a public system, which is great because people can um, study music um, for free and get a lot of uh, really great program with very different subjects um, already from the very beginning. Um, so the normal thing was to start uh, with eight. I started with, um, with seven. And, uh, well, Funnily, my first um, piano teacher um, was a harpsichordist and forte pianist himself. Um, so though we had that, now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's not usual, you know, that yeah. as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, that you would go into forte piano. Yes. Um, so well, I I actually started um, yeah with with piano with him, but. You know, like there was a harpsichord um, in our classroom, and sometimes we would, when I was playing Bach symphonies or inventions, uh, we would go to the harpsichord and and try it out. And then the, that's so cool. Yeah, it was, <laughs> was very nice, and um, yeah, it was also in a way a bit maybe, um, yeah, not, not a bit uncommon in the way that um, he was kind of this baroque expert who would like write me ornamentations and things on the scores already from when I was very young. So all of this felt very natural. And sometimes I went to, to his place and I, I also saw that he had really a big collection of, of historical instruments and like clavichord, a forte piano, a square piano. It was really amazing. And and I, yeah, I, I, I felt the big connection already from the beginning to these instruments and when I was kind of 11 12 I had the possibility of um, of changing to to harpsichord if I if I wanted um, but I kind of I, I spoke with my mother who is also a musician and I also started with piano basically because she was playing piano she was she was a, a music theory um, teacher and, you know, like I just saw my mom <laughs> playing and I wanted to do the same. And then we thought, well, maybe Yeah, I was going to ask. 
Yes. Yeah. If you if you have musicians in your family, because um, well, it's interesting. You, you said you you didn't start so early. Um, by some standards, usually it might be a little bit uh, younger than seven or eight, but that's not so old. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, I have um, I have friends who are um, professional pianists and started being teenagers, like fourteen, sixteen. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, so th- then we thought that maybe sp- it would be better to specialize a bit later. And um, now that I think of it with uh, re- a bit of retrospective and that I also have met later in my life other um, early music uh, musicians, I realized it would have been nice to do both at the same time. Uh, but, you know, there's a bit of this, uh, like, Usually piano teachers are not very happy if you're also studying uh, historical instruments at the same time. Really? Yes, yes. Really? At least in Spain, they were very conservative and they were not not happy about uh, oh. students. Uh, but I, I even see it um, sometimes also here um, in Switzerland in some cases, like, yeah, some students who go to have this kind of minor in for the piano and then they go back to uh, piano and... The, the professors are like, oh, your fingers are now, you know, like too soft and whatever. But I think it's it's maybe on a technical aspect. I understand why, but yeah, yeah I think you it, should have both. <laughs> no, I th- I think you can actually learn a lot, and you you well, I will tell later. But um, it really helped me also to go back to the to the modern piano uh, at a later point. So, um, yeah, then I I continued with uh, with my piano studies. And um, I had uh, two wonderful, really amazing teachers who were really very open-minded. Uh, one of them was Claudio Martinez Menner, who was the assistant of Dimitri Bashkirov. And um, yeah, he was a very, or well, he is a very inspiring musician who uh, has a lot of curiosity um outside the piano like he was also reading a lot and knowing a lot of historical sources and um, also being very curious about historical instruments even if he wasn't playing himself so much on on historical instruments and and he was always encouraging the students that every time that that we would have an opportunity that we should um, go and 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 play on them and at some point um, in my bachelor in piano, I was um, a bit disappointed, kind of, um, of the maybe the music world or the um, maybe it was just about my the conservatory where I was studying. Um, but I I really didn't feel very happy about the idea of myself in a pianist who is just locked uh, down in a in a practice room for eight hours and you know like with this uh, very competitive. Um, mentality that sometimes you you feel and um, I felt kind of a bit depressed and, and blue and and at some point yeah I I, I, I at the end of the studies I, I kind of over overcame this um, but there was something in, in me I think that that um, felt kind of of yeah of unhappy that oh, with certain things of, of what I saw. Um, had nothing to do with with my professor that I admire very much, but more like the um, atmosphere around, um, yeah. And I also uh, maybe something that that we shared. I I also want would have liked to to um, study philosophy. <laughs> um, when when I was in in high school, I I wanted to do both, but then I felt you know like under this pressure that I should just um, concentrate uh, on on piano. And also when I was a child, I wanted to be a writer, not a, a musician. But then I discovered music and I fell in love. And I realized that there was kind of this big world of of images and imagination also inside uh, inside music. And I realized I was better with music than with words. Um, yeah. And then um, I decided to, to go to Basel, um, to this Schola Cantorum Basiliensis, who is one of the best places for, for early music with a lot of specialists and, and so on. And um, it was maybe maybe quite, um, yeah, kind of, yeah, also uncommon in the sense that my colleagues were 
harpsichordists, baroque violinists, uh, medieval um, harp players, uh, and, and so on. So it was really not not very common, and and I was almost the outsider who was playing classical music and romantic music. Um, and I was also studying harpsichord as a minor. And and yeah, I remember like um, we would um, have these um, concert, um, th- these class concerts, and then people would come and they would be like, "Oh, but you play Brahms on historical instruments? Is that not something that you do just in the at the Hochschule in the you know the classical music department?" And um, so even in in early music, they were surprised that, that you could go so far um, in time um, with with historical instruments. And uh, for me, the first time I, I saw a forte piano, I was I felt completely in love with it, and I was like, okay, this is what I, I want to do. Um, this was in yeah during some um, summer um, master classes um, of actually of piano, uh, where one could also have the possibility of doing some um, historical instruments. And I had then started with a bit of, of harpsichord. This was when I was still in Spain. And and yeah, it was like an immediate click. I, I was also in a master class with uh, Robert Levin. Um, and he also does, of course, a lot of forte piano and, and piano. And um, he had a forte piano in his class. So depending on the repertoire, you could go to the piano or to the uh, classical forte piano. And he felt also that I, I had this connection to the forte p- piano and that it was very strong. So <laughs> he was kind of giving me the key in the breaks so that I could play a bit on the forte piano. <laughs> and That's great. Was- it seems like there are a lot of... It seems like there's a lot of um, uh, circumstances that drew you to the harpsichord and the historical instruments, even from an early age. And yes. um, it's interesting to hear you going back and forth between modern piano and um, forte piano. So a few questions came in mind as you were telling me about your journey. I think you mentioned that you were a little bit disappointed um, and uh, about the environment of the conservatory. And um, I think a lot of people are curious about you know, whether or how to deal with the pressures of, you know, that kind of academic conservatory environment. And so I was curious, was there um, something that made you want to be a musician and continue on being a musician um, during that time when you were a little bit um, unsure or a little bit depressed about it? Some feelings that that many classical musicians feel of of self-doubt and, you know, like, uh, being over critic um, with myself and but at the same time I think my connection to music was so strong and in music I felt um, like just a, a better world in a way um, that this wasn't destroyed I know that for some people it even gets so bad that it can even get destroyed so even if the environment wasn't great still um, the being with music, um, yeah, play, playing for myself still felt uh, like, yeah, like kind of a temple of, <laughs> of, um, of beauty and, and, and good feelings. It was more about the institutional part of it and, and the studies and the, maybe the, even the music industry competitions and, you know, all of this stuff. That's wonderful, though, that the music ultimately was your energy and your motivation to keep going and uh, pursuing music and being a musician. Um, But I got to ask, as someone who is very curious about different kinds of pianos through the different ages, and even, you know, with Steinway, you can tell there's a lot of um, differences between uh, different decades of the pianos, and especially last year when I played... um, some in the Robert Schumann house, it was very fascinating. So for those who don't know, from someone who has both, you know, the extensive experience with pianos and forte pianos, what are some of the main differences? Well, maybe the, it's it's quite difficult to, to explain, but I will try to explain it also for a general audience. Um, I think maybe the biggest difference is that um, kind of the, the was, um, or maybe what, what um, people forget a bit is that um, the model that we have today as the kind of the modern piano is um, is one model 
and um, it's kind of copies of of this model. Um, but back in the 19th century and, and 18th century, there was a much bigger um, diversity of um, constructing uh, possibilities. Um, so in a way, there is many people just um, think that um, the forte piano is one instrument, but actually, as you said, um, it's exactly that. Um, they are so different as, yeah, you know, like <laughs> that there are just so many different, even from different countries. Um, and even in the same time, some were a bit more conservative on other ones had all the f new features that they were incorporating. Um, so it, it's also difficult because actually the modern piano was, um, well, or it's considered to be having invented in around the 1850s. Um, so in the middle of the 19th century, um, let's say like the model, of course, if you compare a piano of nowadays and, and a Stenway of, of, of this decade, the materials would be a bit different, but let's say that the model um, in the construction um, was, was similar. Um, yeah, so it's, it's difficult to say when a piano starts uh, becoming a piano, but some people say that is the, um, the, the, cro the strings that got um, crossed. Um, and um, some others um, think that it's about the uh, um, double chapement, the this double um, escapement um, that Erard, um, um, yeah, um, made the, the, the patent. Um, and um, yeah, so um, from the very first uh, models of, of Christophery, you already find um, like um, this um, kind of furniture that is the same as a harpsichord. I mean, the, let's say that the, the case is just like a harpsichord and they even sometimes change the mechanic uh, between forte piano and, and harpsichord in the, in the time. Um, so kind of the same instrument could be used um, as, as both. Um, but also the, the hammers were completely different and um, that the shape of the hammer was um, of course different. And then with the time, um, if you also look at the mechanic of a Christopher instrument, they were really extremely simple. And then if you go, uh, yeah, um, more to the 19th century, the things start getting more and more complicated and they were adding um, more stuff to the mechanic and more pieces and more pieces and, and then it got um, in a way much uh, much more complicated. And um, yeah, the the sound is different. The, the um, size keys, the, 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 the size of the keys can also be different uh, from the modern piano, of course, depends on the model. Um, sometimes also the amount of pedals, um, for example, in, in Vienna in the beginning of the 19th century, like 1820s or so, um, they were crazy about having so many uh, different pedals with different um, effects. Yeah, I remember. I remember when I was in Italy in Bologna. That was so fun. I played on, I think, an instrument of Mozart's time. And it had one of those uh, knee pedals. Is it even a pedal if it's not with the foot? But it's, it's like a, a knee lever, lever that yes. makes, um, yeah, that makes a uh, oh, like a not a drum, but it it had like a oh. <laughs> percussive uh, effect, and it was so funny to because I I could be a percussion like an actual cup percussionist with this uh, knee pedal while playing normally the piano. So I funny. wanted to say yeah. that I just yeah. I just came now from from Bologna and I thought very much of, of you because I I remember watching your video. I I had been there already. Did you visit the Yes, yeah yeah yeah. You visit the same collection. Yeah. Yeah yeah, oh. we even had a, a small kind of workshop uh, concert there and um, now the mm -hmm. new director is is a colleague of of mine from from the Scola Cantorum in Basel. Ah. And small uh, world, was, I didn't know there's a new director now. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the former one um passed away, and um, yeah, it was it was just so amazing to have all of these these amazing instruments and also this um kind of harpsichord um for the piano at the same time. I don't know if you remember it for you as a player to play on, you know, we talked about the mechanical aspect of the you know differences between 
modern pianos and forte pianos but Gray's a player maybe you can explain I mean I, I think I know but you have a lot more experiences and many 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 more hours of playing on forte pianos for you as a player what are some of the differences and things you have to think about um, when you have to switch around a lot between instruments yes um, I, th- I think as, as uh, modern pianists we are very sensitive sometimes to the difference that we also find in modern pianos but of course with historical um, forte pianos it's so big and sometimes I also struggle a lot as a performer, you know, like to have maybe in, in 10 days to have one program with a classical for the piano and then with a harpsichord and then with a romantic for the piano all in, in very little time. And, and you um, have to learn to kind of to adapt very fast and sometimes also in very little amount of time. You also have to learn to um, communicate to the organizer that you need this time. Because sometimes, you know, like um, they are, um, yeah, they are curators of, of festivals, maybe who they are used um, to maybe, a, yeah, to, to, to more of the modern world in which, um, of course, you need time to practice, especially if you travel from, from far. But it's usual, usually you, you get maybe um, half a day or a couple of hours um, in the worst case. Uh, for getting to know the acoustics and of course with um, with forte pianos ideally um, you would need probably a, a day or so to to get to use the to get used to the instrument and this would be even not a lot <laughs> um, sometimes of course you are in the in the situations in which which I have had that I didn't get the opportunity of even trying out the instrument before the concert. <laughs> um, so yeah, you you got you have to get this kind of um, sixth instinct um, instinct in a way that um, you have to adapt very fast. And um, I think the way in a in a certain way is having a uh, also developing a technique that is very flexible. I don't know if this makes sense. Uh, but in a way, uh, to me, it does. That can be, yes, because you've uh, gone to these instruments, and also I think with the right mentality of letting the instruments talk to you. Maybe it would be easier to uh, just describe it. It's also, I think, some of the things you adapt to. I'll, maybe I'll just guess, and you can say if it's correct or not. Um, how fast the the response is for the not only the keys in terms of going up and down, but also for the sound to then react. Sometimes, depending on the mechanism, mm-hmm. um, it could be really fast, or it could be, you know, mm-hmm. the key might be really fast, but then the sound might be slow. And so when you play yes. repetitions and ornaments where you have to repeat two keys, it might be, um, you might have to adjust to play it a little bit slower so that you have enough time exactly. for the mechanism to react to you so there's that and then um i guess actually i don't know about this for sure forte pianos did all of them change from the plucking was that the was the plugging just the harpsichord or was some of the forte early forte pianos also plugged no that's uh, the, let's say that the difference between harpsichords and forte piano is that exactly that that the harpsichord is going to be plucked and the forte pianos are going to be um, weak with the hammer. Yes. So what's yes, it like exactly. for you? Because you can also feel the little vibration when it does plug, don't you? Uh, and then, you mean with, uh, the, with the harps? With the harpsichord, can't you feel like a little bit, I don't know, whenever I, I sure, play on sure. a harpsichord, oh. the few times I, you kind of feel like the little vibration of like it plugging and it, it kind of relax, acts. Um, yes, know, uh, it's the feeling of the jack, of course. I think all of all of what you said um, is exactly that. I think you should also adapt, of course, um, to the differences between uh, the different octaves, so the different registers of the instrument, um, because um, ah. in in modern piano, I would say that it's a bit more homogeneous uh, in a in a, in a way. Uh, but sometimes with historical for the pianos, you find is extremely powerful basses but sometimes not so much depending on the model and sometimes you find rather weak um, like um, soprano or, or higher register and um, you have to also find how to make the melody sing um, and also of course the, the pedaling also it's it's something that you have to adapt very much um, because um, tell me about that they, they also um, 
Yes. So I think that the dumpers, um, they're also quite different and they how they dump the um, the sound is different from, um, from the modern piano. So you have to get to know um, how the dumpers work in every different um, forte piano, of course, be it uh, with a knee lever or be it uh, be this kind of old-fashioned Viennese. I don't know if you um, remember, it's kind of a track um, that goes high and down. And sometimes it's very regular how it um, it uh, um, yeah stops the sound depending on the register. Sometimes, sometimes the bass um, yeah doesn't stop the sound very fast or the or and so on. So you really need need um, to get to know um, how you know like to use the, the pedal or the or the knee lever. In general, um, there's of course also a part which is not just an adjusting of the instrument, but um, itself the part of performance practice, so to say. And for example, when I was uh, studying for the piano, um, I think like the first years, I would have to learn everything without pedal, all the pieces. Uh, my, my professor mm-hmm. made me do these uh, to every lesson. Um, and it it's actually makes a lot of sense, not only because we know that um, this was normal, but then because you are less dependent on the pedal. And... Um, in a way, the way of pedaling um, in the time um, was sometimes, yeah, not, not I think in, 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 let's say, I mean, of course, every pianist nowadays does it differently, but there's a bit of more of a conception I, I found that uh, the pedal also makes like the ground uh, sound and that you need in general um, pedal also for the let, let's say for the basic sound I mean that is not every pianist and there are also some pianists who uh, play like Bach without any any pedaling nowadays and so on but in, in let's say that in general they they were more of you know like this um, organist thing of being able to play everything just with the f- with finger legato and then using the pedal where you needed it and or to produce some special effects but not so much, um, for example, the what we call the syncopated um, pedaling nowadays. Uh, that came very late in the in the nineteenth century. Um, I don't know what if you know what is syncopated pedaling. Uh, so it's just this thing of of learning to play the pedal by doing, you know, like you press the key, then you uh, uh, press the pedal, then you um, then you press another key, and then you re- release, and then you press again. Um, uh, so it's not that was, you that put the pedal. That was a thing in nineteenth century. No, no. I th- I think it's it's many times. I mean, like if you see children um, and how the teachers teach nowadays, they sometimes teach to you to pedal legato. Like you have to press a tone, then press the pedal, then next tone, and then uh, press the, the pedal again. Um, so that's what some um, modern pianists call syncopated pedal. I, um, and in, in that time, it was much more common to uh, press the pedal at the same time as the chord, you know, like in tempo. So oh. it was not so much used to produce a legato effect, um, but it was more used, um, yeah, like in, in tempo. Uh, you would press the keys and the pedal almost at the same time. It probably, does it have to do with how fast the instrument reacts back then in terms of when you press it, does it somehow with the timing of the plucking or, or the hammers somehow it has to be together with the with the keys or what do you think is the reason for that no i, I think it's more like um like aesthetic um way of of thinking um that you know in a way they they didn't think of of the especially back in the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century they didn't think so much of of pedaling as a way of producing legato um, they just thought of it more of as a color. Actually, the pedal was at the beginning called uh, forte pedal. So it was used, uh, for example, for forte passages. And in that moment, you would uh, play it um, in time um, just to give a bit of, of resonance. Hmm. Interesting. I learned something. Thank you. <laughs> was this uh, a tradition in the Baroque or also throughout the different periods of music? Uh, I think it... it um, I think it also had something to do, for example, with the fact that, um, of course, the well, first of all, the, the first 
ways of, of pedaling that we have were um, like hand stops, you know, you know, like um, like you had this, for example, when Haydn writes um, this open pedal, um, what he means is that you just raise the, the dampers and it just gives this uh, improvisation sonority. So that would have been the first step. And then with the knee levers also, because in a way it's not very natural to be using them all the time, you know, like, um, because it's it's quite difficult to, in a way, to use them for every chord or for every moment. So it, uh, in a way, it was more primitive than a pedal. Um, so that's why um, I think they also used it a bit more in a kind kind of to say a bit more primitive in the sense that they they played forte and then they um, raised the 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 knee lever but they maybe didn't have in that moment these subtleties and then the pedal became a real pedal and then they started actually um experimenting a lot uh, about different types of pedaling um so in the beginning of the 19th century 18 uh 20s and even 1810s they were trying a lot of uh, you read these very different descriptions of different ways of pedaling um and but still it was more like yeah um in general they tried more to um to put it uh, kind of in time and and then more in the middle of the 19th century it got more common to have this kind of more legato um, pedal but you also see it from the writing in a way um if you have of course a base where you need to keep the base um then of course you you also need to use this uh, legato pedaling. Fascinating. Do you find yourself changing up your interpretations based on the instruments, or do you think you stick with a certain historical interpretation that uh, fits with the historical instruments of the time, and then just kind of try to have that throughout your different performances on different instruments? Ah, I, I think really not at all. And uh, this is uh, oh, actually also something very humbling for your, kind of for, for the ego, <laughs> because in a way you can't uh, go to a forte piano with a preconception of a piece. It's exactly what, what you describe that because of the mechanics, because of the instrument and, and because of the different characteristics, um, you have to learn to, you cannot impose your idea over the instrument but you have to learn the instrument to tell you um, certain things that doesn't mean that the instrument is maybe going to radically change the hundred percent of what you had in mind Um, but um, it kind of inspires you to um, and it also gives you the idea that there is just not one correct interpretation but many different possibilities of performing one um, one piece and well, besides that, of course, I, I also try to put it, put it together with the historical information that I have. Um, but I think it, listening to the instrument is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine that sometimes you might play a passage faster or slower b- based on the resonance of the instruments and how um, it speaks to you, I could imagine. Um, for those who might want to get it into you know, historical research for knowing how to interpret a piece. Do you have any recommendations on how to even get started? For example, I was in a bookstore of um, kind of, I guess, antique books or or just older books uh, about performance and uh, history of instruments. And I was trying to look for information about ornamentation. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly Every time I played an ornament of Scarlatti or Bach, I roughly know from in the past uh, how I was told to play and the different possibilities, but I don't really know historically how they did it. So how might, you know, I think I might not be the only one playing Bach or Scarlatti or Baroque pieces or even um, Beethoven and Haydn and different ornamentations. How would or how do you recommend someone go into researching that i think it can be very because i i've also seen it in in myself and in colleagues uh, it can be very, be in a way very overwhelming this kind of this um historical concept and i think at some point um of course it's good to to get to um know as much as as we can but um i think one shouldn't feel overwhelmed you know 
just we, one should also trust you know their own intuition and their their own taste and, and they lo- develop these and maybe what I, I feel that can be a bit too much for some people is that when you then go to a specialist and then they tell you like oh you should read um, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and Leopold Mozart and this treatise and the other one and blah 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 and then at some point they end up you know like with a pile of books in German, uh, in old German, which are very difficult to read, and then finding the translation, and then seeing these tables of ornaments, and uh, I think it's quite tricky. Um, so, of course, there are some uh, kind of important books, as I said, maybe like um, Carl Philipp, Emanuel Bach, um, Versuch is, of course, a, a very important book, and also some, um, yeah, like Leopold Mozart also, or there in the 19th century that there are also um, several um, piano schools that were very important. Uh, for example, even for Robert Schumann, it was very important, the School of, of Hummel, uh, which is a very <laughs> thick book. Um, but sometimes I think it's also healthy in a way to, um, to go also to modern studies um, um, where, you, where kind of specialists already have looked at the sources so that not everyone has to re- read um, uh, you know like 5,000 pages of, of of this of course if they have the time they, they should do it uh, but sometimes I think it's also fine to you know like research a bit about what books on ornamentation or on performing practice they can be actually my PhD um, director Clive Brown has a very good book um, on 18th and 19th century performance practice um, I think it's it's called um, classical and romantic performing tr- practice uh, by Clive Brown, and it's a very good um, kind of. I mean, it's not a summary because it's very thick, also, but uh, I think it it could help uh, very much. So the different um, what is it performance practice? Yeah, performance practices. Do you find yourself gravitating towards one over the other, or? Yeah, for example, how, how you approach, let's say, Beethoven, who is watching us right now. Um, do you go for the 18th century performance practice of Beethoven or the modern performance practice of Beethoven? Yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say um, that I try to, to get inspired um, by some of the sources of uh, musicians who were around Beethoven. Um, or of the time, um, like for example, Czerny, who had studied with him and, and who wrote so much about uh, Beethoven's interpretation. But I also find very interesting how, um, um, yeah, Beethoven in a way became kind of a topic in the 19th century because he was like the, such a big idol. And for me, it's also very interesting, for example, to know how uh, people like Liszt or Clara Schumann or other or Karl Reinecke or other musicians in the 19th century performed Beethoven and sometimes even going up to the beginning of the 20th century uh, where we have for example these um, instructive editions um, that nowadays they are very criticized because we come maybe a bit more from this kind of urtext um, world uh, in which we try to um, you know, like go just to the manuscript and the first edition. Um, but I think they also have a lot of, of, of value in, in a way um, because they, they were also made by the greatest interpreters of, of the time. Um, so I try to combine uh, a bit of a bit of this, but also at the end, I, I also grew up listening to, to Beethoven as a 20th and 21st century person. So, of course, there are yeah. also some influences of... I, I got to know the modern piano. So. I think you mentioned that you learned something from the modern piano uh, that inspires you in your understanding of forte pianos and historical instruments, if I understood correctly. Um, and so maybe we could end on this. What have you learned from both kinds of instruments that kind of helped you understand... Uh, keyboard instruments in general more it's it's a bit difficult to say if if what i i learned from the modern piano inspired me um when i went to historical instruments because uh, in my education with historical instruments there was a bit of this attitude be it uh, good or bad but there was a bit of this attitude of restarting from the beginning 
um, from my professors. Um, so in a way, I think my path was a bit, yes, um, of course, what I learned from my, um, maybe not so much, I think what, what stayed with me was not so much what I learned from the modern piano, which of course I learned a lot about colors, about singing possibilities, about so many things, and also from pl from playing um, later repertoire, like 20th century repertoire, also how to translate this. Um, I mean, how, how, how this, this also conception could maybe in a way subconsciously influence um, my playing, but um, I think in a, way, in a way it was more the other way around um, that I, I had a bit of this, uh, you know, like what I mentioned before, this kind of crisis with, uh, um, with um, music uh, education and, and music, classical music uh, industry in general. And then um, after doing some years in which I mostly only played on, on harpsichord and, and forte piano, and then I came back to doing more projects um, with with modern piano, and in a way, um, what I had learned from harpsichord and forte piano helped me so much, um, also with my uh, with my technique, and also with my conception of music and my flexibility with the instrument. That I think, in a way, my um, my modern piano playing benefited, um, I think, enormously from from what I learned from. From, and I, I think I really I can say that I became a much better pianist um, through this contact with with historical instruments, which is something that maybe people find surprising. But for me, it was really like this. Why would people find it surprising? Actually, I mean, I understand why because you are trained to be a lot more flexible. I mean, I only get this between a hundred over a hundred year old piano versus a two-year-old piano and even that I learn a lot from the just adjusting to the different action and the feeling of the keys and that has helped me a lot uh, also so I can understand but why would someone be surprised about forte pianos helping um, a pianist be a better pianist than the modern piano I don't know it makes perfect sense to me <laughs> I think that there are just some prejudices yeah, yeah, I think it's just just some kind of prejudices sometimes of a more conservative maybe sector, but um, but I think things are also changing. I I think also forte pianos were very neglected, um, and it took quite a lot of time for um, the classical music world to respect um, um, these historical instruments. Um, if you think like um, yeah, like the pioneers of of playing for the piano, they had to defend themselves a lot also, because they were very criticized in the beginning. Also, baroque uh, players in the seventies and eighties. In the beginning, people were like, you know, like, what are they doing playing in uh, with another temperament and with gut strings? They sound awful, and <laughs> it's it's and they had to defend a lot themselves also also from the marketing um, point of view. But nowadays it's much more better established and, and more respected, but yeah. I was not aware of this tension between historical and uh, modern classical, even though it's, you know, classical, it's not like modern classical as in music uh, this past century, but it's interesting. We talked about a lot of uh, things about the piano and your experience knowing the different ages of instruments didn't really get to talk so much about yourself, but I, I think I saw in your bio that you got appointed as a co-director of, um, was it the La Nouvelle Athens? Congratulations. Do you <laughs> want to tell us a little bit about um, that and what's ahead of you? Yes. Um, so this is, um, well, I, I think, um, yeah, in a, in a way, I think um Forty pianos also have to get to be a bit more accessible, um, both for the for the public and and also for um, institutions and for piano students. Because as I said, I think you can benefit greatly from having um, this contact. Um, so I, I had a, a kind of a connection in in Paris because I I was um, awarded with um, some 
yeah, kind of um, artist in uh, residency in in, a, in an abbey, and then I through the contact with uh, with the person who was the director there, um, we decided um, after the program there closed in, in this um, abbey um, to continue try to find ways of of continuing promoting the the fortepiano. Um, so that uh, pianists, harpsichordists, organists, or just uh, amateurs, or just you know like music lovers could just could come and either go to concerts um, uh, with um, with historical instruments and, and listen to them, or have some workshops and or master classes, and also some kind of guided coaching about um, about these instruments. And and yes and um, and then after after some years um, they changed the, the direction and and we are trying to see how we can we can continue of course with the uh, um, with with COVID and everything everything has been quite difficult but we are there in in Paris and we have two beautiful instruments uh, uh, Viennese Streicher. Um, from the middle of the 19th century. And then we also have a French era uh, from the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And I'm also trying to do the same in, in Spain with another project, um, which, yeah, coincidentally also has a French name, Notre Temps. And I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm, I feel very excited about, um, yeah, you know, like sharing this, this love and this passion um, of, on... Um, about historical instrument with with other people and and for people to get to to know these instruments because for me it, it feels it feels sad sad that many times um, yeah that pianists go all through their studies and maybe they or even uh, through their careers and they haven't had the opportunity of of ever playing on a um, historical instrument so yeah well you are of course very welcome to visit us one day in, in Paris if you would like. Yeah, no, I was just, yeah, I would love to. I was just thinking um, when my next travel would be to visit again a collection of uh, historical instruments. I, I love being able to travel back in time and discover the sounds or guess about the sounds of um, some of these composers that we now play on modern instruments. And so it was very, um, a little bit shocking to me to hear that there is this prejudice against uh, historical instruments and uh, players of historical instruments uh, some time ago that there's this tension that I, I didn't know existed uh, it's kind of like a res- show of respect even to the composers to get to know their instruments and the uh, uh, forte mm-hmm. pianos do you find yourself playing this is I know I keep wanting to wrap up but I have more questions so I was just thinking do you find yourself playing um newer repertoire on older pianos or do you try to be historically correct in terms of choosing what repertoire to play on uh, which historical instrument i think usually it, it works more the other way around i mean i've i've i know that for example there's i think even a jazz piano uh jazz trio playing with uh forte piano so I've I've, really? I've seen also I've never heard of this DBC <laughs> or <laughs> yes yes uh, and I think there are people maybe playing uh, even you know like uh, DBC um, on on forte piano more for fun than than something like this I don't do this so much but what I do quite a lot um, it's the other way around that for example I would play on a mid 19th century for the piano music of Bach or of Mozart um, because it was also a repertoire that they also played in the in the 19th century so I also like um, to um, this idea also of imagine how could you know like romantic um, performers have played the music of the of the 18th, 18th century and sometimes you just have to deal with what you find I mean sometimes it's I also don't want to be kind of a purist in, in a way at all in the sense that 
uh, there are some people that are like, oh, this if you play a Beethoven program, then you need uh, four different instruments for each of uh, different sonatas and um, that you are going to play, and so that you can also show how Beethoven. I mean, of course, this is very fascinating, but this is not sometimes the reality um, that you find. Sometimes you just are lucky enough to have uh, one for the piano, and then you might have to do some compromises either playing also some earlier Beethoven on a later forte piano or the other way around that you have a very early forte piano so you even have to change a bit the music because you don't even have enough keys um, and you have to play some things in an octave lower <laughs> or oh. change the music. Wow, I didn't know you actually transcribed the music to fit the instrument. <laughs> well, I, I think sometimes it's it's just just needed um, because sometimes it's it was just a matter of maybe four notes that are missing or one note sometimes that it's missing, so so sometimes uh, you you need to do. I played for example um, I think uh, one year ago was it? Oh. <laughs> Time flies. Um, I played a hundred nine um, on a forty piano that was missing the the low E, so I I just. Um, just had to readapt a couple of passages. That's life. Well, it's easy, I guess. This is again going back to the flexibility that you learn from playing on forte pianos and then learning to adjust based on the circumstances on the instruments so uh it's fascinating well anything else that we should um talk about we have talked for a really long time i didn't expect to go to uh, so many different uh topics about historical instruments but it's been great no i'm 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 really really happy i think uh, for me for me it's really fine and i i'm really happy because i i I feel that I, I shared many things by, by coincidence um, with you, like this love for historical instruments. And we didn't also talk very much about it, but um, also this love for for Robert and, and Clara Schumann, which I also admire very much. And he's my also my favorite composer. Yeah, and that's great. I, I had in my notes, actually, that you have a debut in 2023 with uh, their music, right? On Forte Pianos with Orchestra? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's really I, exciting. I I I don't know. I <laughs> I got lucky enough to well, it's not really I mean I had played with some uh kind of youth orchestras and, and so on as a as a soloist, but this was this is something kind of big with uh with Forte Piano now. And um yeah, it's it's just very very exciting. It um it's with a Belgian orchestra that was conducted uh, for many years by uh, Jos van Immersel. But now it will be, um, yeah, conducted from the violin from, by someone else, and I will play the uh, Robert Schumann Concerto, <laughs> and also in the uh, a piece by a um, um, composer that also Clara knew because it's kind of a concert dedicated um, in a way to to Clara, and we in the um, we are also playing the trio as kind of an intermezzo, and also they will play some uh, mm. music I think by. By Joachim was it? I think, or no, 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 not not Joachim, but something related, um, yeah, to something that Joachim the violinist um, conducted, or 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 something like this. So I'm I'm very well, very excited luck. about it, and uh, yes, uh, I am also very um, yeah, I am very thankful that you also share kind of your how your you know like freelance musician. Uh, you know the backstage is and sometimes we know you know like with orchestras and how the process goes and um yeah and i'm i'm very thankful that you share all of this uh, with us yeah well, thank you i have so much that i need to edit and post about behind the scenes stuff but um thank you for sharing uh, about your journey with forte pianos and pianos and just your journey in general as a musician and uh, best of luck to your projects and we will try our best Thank to you. promote also 
historical instruments on together with classical. So I think we should talk oh, about that nice. and uh, stay in touch. But thank you so much for being part of Classical Chats. Thank you very much for having me and yeah, all the best. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this Classical Chats and learned something about historical performances today. Be sure to check out our other episodes of Classical Chats with other people and their journeys about classical music. And I'll see you in the next one. Be kind to keep striving.